Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Kevin Moore Show. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my two guests, Donald R. Schmidt and Tom Kerry. Now Donald is the former co-director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies, where he served as director of special investigations for 10 years. Now he has a degree in liberal arts and is also the author of a number of best-selling books on the subject of the UFO crash at Roswell. Now I'm also joined with Tom Kerry, who has a PhD in anthropology and became interested in UFOs while in high school. Now he rekindled that interest in 1986 when he became the MUFON State Section Director for Southern East Pennsylvania. Now since 1991, Tom's research has focused solely on the UFO incident. Both Donald and Tom have created the world's best historical documentation of the Roswell timeline and are now the world's foremost experts on the Roswell crash as told by the witnesses of the event. Donald R. Schmidt and Tom Kerry, welcome to the show. It's our, our pleasure, I think. Kevin, good to be back with you. So it's <laughs> no, it's our pleasure. Over five years. We're, we're on the original webcams that you had sent us. I don't know how many years ago that was. We did our first webcam, I think, with uh, you, Kevin. That's right. right. Yeah, I remember. I remember so much has happened since then. And I, you know, I, I kept tabs on you a little bit throughout the years, you know, just seeing some of the books that you were putting out there. And um, I, I knew, obviously, one day we would reconnect. And I'm so glad with that we've, you know, reconnected now. Um, and we're still alive. <laughs> you're still alive. Still. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, eight years seems such a long time, right? But, you know, in comparison to the case that you've been working on, it is nothing. And, um, you know, you, why have you stuck with just the Roswell case out of all the types of different UFO cases that are out there? Why, why this particular case? And I'll ask you both that question. Well, I, I, my, my answer is shorter. So uh, because all the other all the other cases bore me, Kevin, all the other cases bore me. This case is the most interesting case of all time. That's that's the main reason that I'm still on the case uh, since 1990. Well, actually, since I first read the, the Roswell incident book, 1980, all the other cases just fell by the wayside for me. So it's the most interesting case. And certainly the most important case. And, and I would say, and, and for that, those very reasons, and uh, to me, it's the granddaddy of all UFO cases, where everything else is very fleeting, you know, something in the sky, possibly something that may land, but uh, nothing or very seldom anything that you're able to take into a laboratory and uh, analyze and actually uh, verify. Whereas with Roswell, not only do we have hundreds of witnesses from different vantage points, military, civilian, the press who were all involved, but then the physical after effects, the physical as far as remnants of the crash, the remains, just the, the, the excitement of, of, of a case that would have provided, you know, the ultimate proof that we are not alone, that we are being visited. And Roswell provides, you know, overnight, you know, you know, that physical proof that uh, there was indeed a crash back in 1947. I know, because you guys have, uh, how long have you both been in this field for now, both of you? Well, for me, uh, are you talking about active, being active? Uh, well, I started out with the MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, in 1986, uh, investigating lo local cases in the Philadelphia area. And all of those cases, Kevin, they were all lights in the sky type cases. And it didn't really forward the study. You know, I mean, geez, I saw a light. Well, isn't that just great? You know, so I got tired of that. And uh, uh, when I read that uh, uh, Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt were reopening the Roswell case in, in 1988, 1989, I said, well, you know, uh, that I'm, I'm already interested in this case. I didn't know somebody else was uh, working on it other than, uh, you know, Friedman and uh, Berliner. And they didn't publish anything since the 1980 book. So that's 
when I became active, uh, I dropped all the other cases and became active with uh, Don Schmidt and Kevin Randall. I think it was in 1991 when I was looking for the archaeologist. So it's been since then. And with me, I had originally been with uh, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And who other than Dr. Jalen Hynek had seen a number of my case reports and he invited me to visit with him at his home in Evanston, just north of Chicago. The time he was still you know, teaching at Northwestern University. And um, I had the wonderful fortune of then working with him over the next eight years and then uh, becoming his director of special investigations. And the one case we wanted to go after was Roswell. But from a skeptical viewpoint, I was a skeptic. We thought we'd make a single weekend jaunt down to New Mexico and prove that, yes, indeed, it was nothing more than a weather balloon device. But then you interview the first 10 witnesses, and specifically the ones who handled the actual wreckage, who could describe you know, the unearthly characteristics of this material that defied conventional explanation. And one by one, we realized, my God, what if we're wrong? And we couldn't get back to New Mexico uh, uh, quick enough. So from February of 89, we were already back in April. And by September of 89, we were actually having our first archeological dig at the debris field site. And then it became a matter of we need to track down as many witnesses and as quickly as we could. And then Tom coming on as far as specifically looking for the archaeologists who were rumored to have been involved, alleged to have been involved. And, um, you know, the rest is history because uh, we feel that for the very fact that the government is presently up to four official explanations, in many respects, they've been responding to us. The fact that the pressure, the number of witnesses, the books, the documentaries, the movie, Roswell, it all has made Roswell a household word around the world. I mean, you can't go into Russia, you can't go into China without mentioning Roswell, and they know exactly what you're talking about. And it isn't weather balloon that immediately comes to the fore. I, I might add, uh, Kevin, that uh, Don and I became a team. We were sort of the last men standing after the 1997 50th anniversary, everybody else left the field. That was sort of the high point, was the wall-to-wall -wall coverage on CNN of the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident. And everybody said, well, there's no more to find. It's all, everything's been found. But uh, at that time, Don and I both uh, belonged to QFOS, the mm -hmm. Center for UFO Studies. And uh, in May of 1998, we teamed up to say, well, let's see what else we can find. And uh, we've been a, a team uh, since then. Yeah. Oh, well, I can, I can see that. I mean, just it, has it become a bit of an obsession, do you think? Or is it just something that you just really, really just have to, to want to keep pushing and, 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 and want to go as far as you can with this now? Uh, obsession's a loaded word. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Kevin, but uh, it's an interest that we have. We're not obsessed. I know some UFO people, and I'm sure Don knows them too, that are obsessed with something. Uh, but we're not obsessed. We, uh, we're looking for uh, information, uh, physical, da physical records, things like that. But, you know, Don has another life. I have another life. It's, this, is not, this is not the obsession uh, it's of been, our lives. It's been quite the devotion and the commitment to finish the investigation. As Tom has been, you know, describing that to become obsessed is to, you know, become so myopic, so transfixed on a preconceived theory that you don't notice anything else on the sidelines. And it's gotten us, you know, in trouble at times because we don't leave any stone unturned. Someone, you know, approaches us with possible uh, evidence whether uh, physical evidence or even uh, photographic, video, slides, what have you. The point being, we have to check it out because it's only going to take that one time that we finally will have our smoking gun, our holy grail, as we call, you know, specifically the memory material that eyewitnesses have described over and over again from 1947. Because 
if indeed it happened, as we are convinced it did, you're talking the biggest story of the millennium. So how do you walk away from that? And as long as the, the race with The Undertaker continued, we had, you know, we, we've had to make every effort to track every last living witness down. And you've done such a wonderful job of that. We were just having a conversation off air where I said on the National Records uh, YouTube channel, they've started to release interviews that you did um, back in the day as though they're saying, well, there's something to this story. I mean, that, that type of um, government department doesn't normally release stuff like that. I was so shocked, and I'm going to link some of the videos in the description of this video below if people want to go check out some of that uh, footage. But just to see these witnesses that you interviewed back in the day telling their story, um, it's absolutely um, amazing. Do you know what I mean? To see them on camera. It's one thing to read about it in, bo in a book, but to actually see them, you know, uh, the, uh, most of these people have passed away now. Uh, their testimony is incredible. Well, the you know, the, at the time of the interviews were done, they were they were still alive. So, uh, you know, uh, it was nice to do the interviews and to get the information. I know every time we get a new witness, I, I just get re-energized re again. And uh, thanks to Hans Adam II, I think is the uh, title, uh, he financed the whole thing. He was interested in doing this. And so help me, I use, I use the... Uh, interviews today as a resource for uh, looking up certain things. But uh, all I can say, because I wasn't there in 1990, uh, it, it, must, it must have been great. Don was there, and he can, uh, he can talk about it with more experience than I can. But, but, Tom, but Tom makes a good point in that most investigators, and I'm talking, you know, even journalists, uh, investigative journalists, they're their paths of research are very linear. They go in a straight line towards the preconceived or you know, a determination of what they're looking for. And I'm afraid that many of our colleagues, they, they approach an investigation in the same fashion in that where Tom and I, our investigation has always been more circular, that you always revert back you move forward, but then you're always still looking backwards. That new witnesses will then provide a new line of questioning for previous witnesses. It's why we would always go back to Walter Hott, for example, the public information officer. We would always uh, we would go back to Glenn Dennis, the, the mortician at the Ballard Funeral Home, because additional information would provide a new line of, 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 of questions, as I mentioned. And so that's why, as long as you're going circular, but you're still moving forward, it's still advancing the investigation. And I think that's an advantage we've had in that we are always, we always remain in touch with these people right up to their deathbeds. And uh, sadly, we were often saying goodbye to these people. We knew it was the last time we would see them. Yeah, that yeah, that's really difficult, isn't it? You know that um, it, you know you know it's not more of a modern case where you can just go back, but then it it, it, it wouldn't be the case it is if you could. Do you know what I mean? I mean, um, but how many people did you interview in total up to up to now? Really, I mean, what sort of fit? What's the figure? I, I just have a gross number in my head, like somewhere around a thousand. But of those, uh, of those, how many had information that we could use? Uh, there's several hundred, maybe up to 600. Uh, does that sound right, Don? Yeah, that's the number we typically use is 600 people, either directly or indirectly involved. And quickly, and I don't want to uh, step on, on your comments, Tom, but, but very often our colleagues will, 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 will drive home their point that secondhand testimony is worthless. Well, secondhand testimony, and you can talk to any good lawyer, you can talk to any good judge, secondhand testimony, thirdhand testimony, when it corroborates firsthand testimony, solidifies the firsthand testimony all the more. So it is not worthless. If, there, if it fills in details, if it provides information that then the firsthand can go, that's right, I forgot that. I didn't remember that, but now that he mentions that, and so it has its own uh, net worth. 
And that's why even now where we're talking to family members, we're talking to sons and daughters, and that's the very reason that deathbed testimonies are admissible in a court of law here in the States, because the courts have determined that people just do not lie to their loved ones in the final throes of their own lives. And so uh, we, we, we find that uh, whatever the information is, if it is part of the full puzzle, we're there to take it. We, we use it. We don't dismiss it for the fact that, well, it's second, third hand, doesn't mean anything. No, to us, it is important. Also, uh, Kevin, it's not a legal case. It's a historical case. Mm -hmm. We're trying to recreate history. And uh, if there was, uh, if secondhand testimony was not admissible, there'd be no history channel. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite channels. There would be no, there would be no history of the World War II, of any uh, previous event, because some of the the uh, uh, interviews are secondhand, secondhand knowledge, and uh, it's not a legal, it's not a legal uh, case. It's a historical uh, construct. Yes, it's a bit like the true crime stuff, where it's a historical reconstruction of an event that took place. Absolutely, and um, well, some, some of the debunkers, for example, they harp on it firsthand. Um, Major James Bagaha, he constantly, you know, points out that there are no reliable witnesses to anything. Well, he's throwing out, as Tom mentions, all of history that nothing is reliable, that you can't believe what you see. You can't trust that there are any reliable as far as testimonies. But then considering people have been executed, people have been incarcerated for life by the, by the very testimony of a lone individual. So to just automatically uh, try to discredit all eyewitness testimony is how faulty their position is. But and also, also uh, Don, uh, uh, judging what's reliable is an opinion. It's mm -hmm. not a fact. It's one's opinion. And uh, you have uh, people like uh, Megahaha uh, saying uh, nothing is reliable. Well, that's because he doesn't believe. Except Roswell. what he says. Except what he Except says. Except what he says. Well, yes. well okay. Did you ever come across witnesses um, that you thought were telling the truth in r relation to this investigation that you found out when checking their details further or verifying, you know, information about them that actually they falsified the information to you? And for what reason would they have done that? I don't know. But did you come across that? Uh, I think we <laughs> <laughs> I think the first one that comes to mind is Frank Kaufman. FK, yes. And uh, I, I don't know what Don felt when he first interviewed uh, Kaufman, but I came on the scene when you guys already had Kaufman, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, this guy's full of it. You know, that was my impression. I'm thinking, he, this guy is full of it, but I, I didn't say anything because I was brand new to your investigation, right? And uh, he was just too glib, and he, ne he never carried himself, and he never sounded like a high officer, which he claimed to be. And uh, thanks to us, and Don can go into this, we finally said, uh, Frank, why did you do it? Yeah. And uh, he was on his deathbed when he told us. He was, he was our, our star witness in our second book, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. And uh, Kaufman had been checked out by a law firm who came away saying this this man is legitimate. CBS investigated Kaufman and said uh, his bona fides check out. Phil Jones at CBS 48 Hours, you know, came away saying that one of the best witnesses we've ever had on the program. So we, as Tom described, though, because we had growing doubts and suspicions and he just was too good to be true. And as a result, even in his final uh, days here on Earth, as we approached him and hoping to provide him with a, a deathbed confession of admitting that uh, he had falsified everything. And it wasn't until after he passed away that we found all the bogus documents, everything that had been falsified. Cut and paste. Cut and yeah, paste. Cut and paste. Stuff. 
and uh, he was not who he claimed he was. He was indeed at the base, the Raza Army Airfield, at the time of the incident. He, he, made, was not a, he was not a high officer. He was a personnel oh. clerk. Yeah. He was, he was a, a personnel clerk. He was a, a master sergeant. That was the highest rank he could reach. But he may have actually come in possession of some physical evidence right. and got caught. He got uh, essentially caught with his hands in the cookie jar. And uh, we, we think that that's the reason he was kept behind instead of returning back to New York as an aspiring artist as he was that uh, he immediately uh, was, was hired by the Chamber of Commerce in Roswell, and he manned the store. And when we came in the town, he immediately latched on to us and did all he could to distract us, divert us, wanted to know about every new witness we were coming up with. And uh, he did his best. But uh, Tom was with me when we sat down with him one last time uh, for, uh, uh, for a breakfast. And uh, we uh, disclosed uh, something. Uh, we, we had the goods on him right. regarding a, a coded message. And I forget, how, thank God there was a wall behind his chair because he tipped back and the wall prevented him from falling, you know, totally you know, to the floor. And he came back and he pointed at us and he went, damn, you guys are good. So we took that as a compliment. Yeah, it's a, such a shame when that happens, and I'm sure there was more than just him um, and, and others. Maybe that will come in, forward in the future. Who knows, right? It's, it's, it, you know, you've got to use due diligence. You've got to do the research. It, yeah, it I, takes I, experience. It, yeah, it you does. You can't substitute for experience. And Don knows this. We've had a number of people come to us. Oh, how can I help you? How can I help you guys? You know, I live here in Albuquerque or I live where uh, I give me something to do. So you give them something to do. You never hear from them again because they don't know how to do it. They get cold feet and uh, it's all it's all at the moment. They, they they just say, oh, please, can I help you? But they don't have the experience. Well, you know, even even in the, in the past few years uh, of just doing this show since we interviewed together, there's so much uh, crap out there. Right. Um <laughs> There's so many, you know, this water is so mudded in a sense, not just the Roswell story, but the whole UFO community in general. Um, where but that, is often, uh, yeah. that, that, that has been the case from the get-go. And if you remember, Kevin, back in the early and mid-50s, you had what were called the contactees, the George Damskys, the uh, Howard Mengers, and the Daniel Fries, and others. And... We would, we would talk to some of the roadies, some of the people like, like the carnies that would travel with them from city to city because they'd have these big conferences. And they would describe to us how backstage, where they would draw like a thousand people at just an afternoon's you know, affair. And they would refer to them as, the audience would be referred to as marks. So in other words, they were money makers. They were providing them with their, uh, as far as their life sustenance in that regard. And they would describe how more times than not, there would, there would be Air Force officers sitting in the front row and encouraging them, applauding them like, yes, 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 you're, you're telling the truth. As though they were rooting on this nonsense. They were rooting on these charlatans painting the impression that, yes, that this is exactly the, as far as the true representation of the UFO phenomenon. And it only encouraged them and others up to today, as you're mentioning, Kevin, the idea that what better way to quickly, you know, steer as far as a YouTube audience or, you know, a, a Facebook page or a book or a TV show by claiming something, the more outlandish, the bigger the draw. And because they, we have to keep upping the ante. And as, as Tom knows as well as I do, it was the typical red flag whenever a potential witness would come to us. Because more times than not, these were generally reluctant witnesses. We had to prime the pump, we had to, you know, uh, gain their confidence before they would finally open up and talk. And, and, and very often it would take years. And we would work with their spouses. We would work with their, their, their children. 
with the hope that maybe they finally were comfortable enough and they would, would open up, they would talk. But these people that would, hey, you forgot about me. Let me tell you what happened back in 47. Giveaway, total giveaway. And um, these were the ones that almost always turned out to be bogus because they had a story to tell. They had a story to sell. And uh, they were very seldom, if ever, reliable. Yeah. W- w- if I mention the name uh, Philip Corso, um, I-, I interviewed his... I'm sorry, yet, yeah, buddy. I, n- I know. <laughs> I can see Tom's face, right? I interviewed yeah. his uh, son... Um, no, a, a few... They always bring up Corso. Uh, I know. And I, well, I interviewed his son a couple of years ago, and um, I didn't know really what to make of it. He seemed like a nice guy, but I mean, you know, it's not my story. Do you know what I mean? It was his story. But uh, I don't know if that dilutes the work that you guys do or if there's any truth in that. Well, obviously, go on, Tom. You've, uh, you, why, so... why did you bring up Corso? I mean, he just, I don't know that. I guess his book his book was written by William Burns, and uh, New York uh, Times bestseller. Yeah, New York Times bestseller. I give them that much, but the facts. If you read his book, number one, there, there's no uh, no bibliography, no index, nothing like that. It reads. It's almost like a novel. There's because non history uh, non history. I'm sorry, non fiction books all have indices. They all have uh, bibliographies. They all have footnotes. And Don knows what it takes. <laughs> when we footnote our book, it, it takes forever. And you have to be right. But uh, Philip Corso, he was a lieutenant colonel, which is not the highest. I mean, if you're uh, important in the he was in the Air Force, uh, if you're important, you're going to be a bird colonel or higher. They give lieutenant colonel grades as a gift to people who are retiring. And hardly would have access to top secret information. Yeah. Right. And uh, if you read his book, the facts don't jive with the facts on the ground. I, I, as a general statement, they they don't jive. And uh, uh, where he where he zeroes in on some, uh, the general was I forget his name. Um, oh, you know, go check this. Uh, try to read you know, re-engineer all this stuff. And uh, I'm sorry, I, it's just, um, uh, I didn't, uh, I confess I didn't read the whole book because I just got so, so disillusioned with it, with, with his fact base. As it didn't Tom, jive with Roswell. As Tom remembers, the, 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 the opening chapter is a, uh, is a summary, a synopsis of the event, of, of the Roswell incident. And, we immediately recognized it. It was 100% Frank Kaufman, who we were just talking about, the bogus witness, the disqualified witness, who was there but was not involved, who had lied and you know, you know, perpetrated as far as his uh, involvement and it turned out to all be illegitimate. Well, when we were to discover afterwards that Corso who um, we had interviewed on two occasions, very, very kind, you know, polite you know, gentleman as far as um, you wouldn't find or even think that he was trying to deceive you in any way. But again, he did not read, he did, uh, excuse me, he did not write the book. But when we had inquired as to, have you ever been to Roswell before? To which course, as a matter of fact, yes, just before we started to do the book. Uh, I made two trips to Roswell. Oh, and who did you talk to? Well, I actually stayed with someone who I think you might know. Each time I came to Roswell, I was the house guest of Frank Kaufman. <laughs> so, so, he, you know, so he sat at the, at the foot of Frank Kaufman listening to the very same, you know, concoctions that we did. And... Um, if he truly had all the information he did, why would you have to rely on another witness? And then, and, uh, as far as on a non-witness, as it turns out, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention that bad. name. I, you know, I I've been to see his son. It I, ruined I, my day. I yeah. know, I know. Well, I, I was in Florida, and I just called him up, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll do an interview." And I've been trying to get him for years and years. And um, you know, I mean, it's difficult when you're sat in front of these people, and they are telling what they believe 
or, or they're, they're either very good liars, right? Or um, this is what they believe their father went through uh, to some respects, and they don't. I, I, there's many reasons why you know they say what they say, but I'm just saying. And I, I think I think the son wasn't he going to produce a, a piece of physical right. evidence of some yeah. sort that never they were going to they were going to place a monument at yes. the actual crash site. Uh, they were going to provide as far as um, at least substantive you know, proof. Yeah, well, he's out there. He's out there. He exists. His yeah. son exists. And, you know, I've been in his company. And, uh, yeah, he had a, a different but theory. It's, on over, it's over 20 years since his father passed away. So yes. uh, we're, we're still not, waiting. We're still waiting for that. To... Waiting. Right. OK. OK. Um, how many witnesses are still alive? I, Don and I have talked about this. Of the ones that we have interviewed, uh, we're talking first-hand witnesses now. So a, there's a number of second-hand witnesses. But of the first-hand witnesses, the only one that I'm aware of, and Don might, might know another one, I don't, is uh, Elazar Benavides. Mm -hmm. He was a 19-year-old uh, 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 corporal back in 1947, one of our key witnesses to the bodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we speak, he's in a nursing home in Roswell uh, with Alzheimer's. That's the only one I'm aware of. Damn. Yeah, that's uh, that's sad, isn't it? That there's, there's, I there, mean, there, yeah. have, there might be others that that we never were aware of because we couldn't interview everybody. Right. But there might be others that we never interviewed that might still be alive, but we're unaware of them. Right. And uh, just this is my own curiosity in, in no particular order. But um, on the National Archive site, there was an interview there with um, uh, it's, and it sounds so weird. And then it's on the National Archive site. But there was an interview there with uh, Glenn Davis and Glenn, De yeah, Glenn, Dennis. Glenn Dennis, right? Oh, I've got, they put Davis on there, Glenn Davis. They've got that, they, they spelled that wrong on there. Um, unless I took it down wrong, but I don't think it did. Uh, Glenn, means, oh, he, he plays for the 49ers. Right, uh, yeah, definitely not that guy. <laughs> there may be some confusion in the Roswell movie. Glenn Dennis would not allow us to use his actual name. Throughout the movie, all the primary characters you know, allowed us to use their very names. Glenn Dennis would not. So the, the, his last name was changed to Davis. That's why it's got Davis on the, on the National Archives. And now he was um, uh, involved in the, uh, well, he, he actually got onto the uh, base where the bodies were being um, um, autopsied, I guess. Uh, he, ne he never saw anything, but he got to meet a nurse there. And this nurse, who was part of the, you know, autopsy, if you want, I'll just use that word for now, of the bodies, of the recovered bodies, um, she spoke to him and, um, and on base and wanted to get, you know, to get the hell away from there because he knew her. But then obviously there was a time when they got back together and, um, you know, he t she told her the, the, the story. But w was she ever traced down? Because she was supposed to have been um, killed in some sort of uh, f um, flight. Uh, with, with a load of other nurses that were there at the base or doctors at the base at the time. Is that right? Don, you want to handle this or do you want me to? No, Tom, you, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I came on the scene. Uh, the uh, Don and Kevin uh, Randall had been looking for the, the nurse for about couple, two years or so. Years. And uh, they could not find a nurse with the name that Glenn Dennis had provided, that there was never a nurse that they could find in the military or was involved in a, a plane crash, anything like that. And so they went to uh, Glenn Dennis and said, Glenn, uh, we can't find anything on this uh, nurse. And uh, the name that he, he oh, well, I, I gave you a phony name. Oh, that's just great. We spent two years on this and you, you gave us a phony name. So at, at that point, Glenn started, uh, describing this nurse to us he never did give us another name but he described a, a nurse that is in the yearbook knowing that she was already dead that that was the key he described her as she was italian she looked like a young audrey hepburn or she had olive skin and her name in, in the yearbook is a contraction of an italian name so that's adeline fanton who he was describing 
And we had witnesses, and Don knows this, uh, we had witnesses who described Glenn Dennis and Adeline Fanton as a as a item, as a you know they knew that they were they almost looked like a really good friends. He was so that's actually, who, yeah. yeah, that's who he was describing. So um, she that was she was not the real nurse that was there, but that was his construct of the real nurse. So uh, we along along the way, a little later, we. Uh, and, and this is a real convoluted story I'm not going to get into. Uh, and uh, we got two witnesses, uh, Jack and his Jack Box and his wife's name, Lois. The, Jack Box was a machinist back in uh, 19, 18, 19 years old, back in 1947. And uh, they said that their daughter, they, their daughter had information about who the doctor was that was called out to the base. And, and uh, his nurse was the nurse who was called out to the base. And so Don remembers this. We interviewed the daughter in, at the museum over the telephone. Right. And she gave us the name of the doctor back in 1947, who's in the, year, the, the city yearbook. And his son of the same name is still practicing medicine in Roswell. Now, the key thing was when I looked up the doctor's name in the, in the city directory, it gives you also uh, where the person works. And this doctor worked at the Marshall and Marshall Clinic in Roswell. So, oh, that's a, a something to go on. So, uh, Somewhere along the line, I came up with the name of another. Glenn Dennis was an embalmer. He was not a mortician. He was an embalmer. And looking through the uh, base, uh, the, the city yearbook, I came up with the name of a Win, Winifred Brown, who was also an embalmer at R Ballard's Funeral Home. And uh, right next to his name was his wife's name, Juanita Brown who was a nurse at Marshall and Marshall, the clinic. So by this time, Don and I had believed Glenn's story about hearing, uh, getting the phone calls about the child's cases. We went from the child's cases was true. We believe he invented the part about going to the base and running into a nurse and blah, blah, blah. So where would he have heard the story? He would have heard it from the other embalmer whose wife was the nurse. That's where he got the story about the hospital. And, and we have talked to enough other witnesses, including a former chief of police, including a uh, Roswell attorney, who uh, clearly remember Glenn talking, describing the phone calls, inquiring about the child-sized caskets. And then Richard Thiem, a colleague of ours, interviewed who claimed he was the son of the very truck driver who quickly went up to Amarillo, Texas, who would have provided the caskets for the Ballard Funeral Home. And the son remembered that when they returned back to Roswell, that the city was pretty much closed off. That they, as they approached from the east, they had the circle to the west. And they found the road that then enabled them to go to their home. He dropped him off. His father then took the caskets out to the base. He wouldn't return to the next morning. And then he would make the comment about Casper the ghost. Well, that's exactly what we heard from a number of uh, witnesses, including military, who suggested that that was the very description that they were banding about regarding the bodies. Casper the ghost, that they were, you know, like even Marcel, the intelligence officer, white rubbery figures, that type of thing, or that they looked like Casper the ghost. So you see how these, these little pieces, they all plug and, in. And it took us a number of years to, to figure all this out, right? And it took us a number of years to come to this conclusion. And as Don said, we believe the part about the phone calls that he received uh, 
asking for uh, child caskets. We believe that part of a story. But the other part of the story we believe he made up and the most likely source of it, uh, because we never did interview the, the Browns because they were already gone. Oh, right. The most likely source, the most reasonable sources that he always lose, use in uh, uh, you know, uh, trials, the most reasonable conclusion was that he got the story about the nurse from the other embalmer, Winifred Brown, whose wife was the nurse. And, and I wonder why he did that for. Why would he... I mean, it, what, what part of him was was wanting to, you know, you know, to, to, to tell a lie like that? And what part of him was wanting to go on camera to actually at least say some truth about the story? I mean, were they that... It, was it that life-changing for him just to know that something like that had taken place, yet, yet the, the fear yeah. that had been put into the people? Go ahead. Kevin, we have to consider the zeitgeist of the time and that... We, Tom and I approached Glenn on one occasion where we practically accused him of having an affair with the nurse. And he didn't deny it. And it came down to, he was married to his first wife at that time, who was still alive as he was talking with us that very day. His, his second wife, who was with him you know, up until her passing, uh, was, was certainly in the picture. So it would have involved a tremendous embarrassment just, you know, on, on the face of that situation. But then, as, as Tom remembers, there was another nurse by the name of Mary Lowe right. who was also involved. And when we had a, a proxy, a, a woman interview her on our behalf, and the first words out of her mouth were, did Glenn Dennis tell you all about me? In other words, did Glenn break that confidence? And so the next day when we approach Glenn, then he immediately retracts her name. I never told you that, you know, you didn't get the name from me. So it was quite clear that she called Glenn right, right after our investigator had, had left her residence. So... It all smacks of, they all know something, they're all involved, they're all connected somehow, but it takes the investigation, it takes Tom and I to try to figure out exactly how it all comes together. And what we've been describing over the last uh, you know, few minutes is the best scenario that we've been able to put together. So when it comes to evidence right now, obviously people watching this uh, are going to say, well, where's the evidence? So, you know, all these years doing, you know, this wonderful research and so many amazing interviews, right? And um, where are we at now with this puzzle? The, uh, the, uh, maybe you don't know it, but I'm sure you do, that testimony is evidence. In a court of law, testimony is evidence. Certainly in uh, historical constructs, it's, it, uh, it's evidence. It's one part of the evidentiary file. But the, what they're really talking about, uh, Kevin, is they want to see a piece of the ship and, uh, or a body or two. Uh, not that they'll actually believe it or not if they were trotted out. But uh, they're talking about a piece of physical evidence. And as Don mentioned earlier, you know, we've had pieces over the years that turned out to be Japanese jewelry. It turned out to be uh, uh, this and that. And other pieces, they say, oh, well, uh, we're going to send this away to the laboratory. And you never hear about it again. It's gone. You never hear about it again. And uh, we have this latest piece, that uh, one show, uh, I guess it was one of uh, Frank Kimbler's uh, finds out in the desert, these little pieces of aluminum <laughs> that he had uh, analyzed and it and the uh, an analyst uh, so he said what is it uh, sir what is it and he said it's it's aluminum <laughs> and it was like the an, an arrow through the heart you know and uh, but they're still they're still hawking those out there and uh, but what they what they really want is something that's incontrovertible something and it, Don, as, I, as Don and I have said, our holy grail of Roswell is a piece of the memory metal that you can, has been described. You can wad it up, hold it up, 
it'll unfurl itself and just sort of float there. And it's the memory metal. That's what we're looking for. But so far, and we, I think Don knows the same as I did. They're out. We know there are pieces out there somewhere. Uh, someone has got to come forward with the piece. Uh, we've searched with several archaeological digs, but we uh, we have not come up with a piece of uh, uh, memory metal yet. But uh, you know, we believe that at some point a piece will surface. We, I, 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 I think the best example in the aftermath, the concerted effort that the military at that time made in confiscating every last piece of physical evidence would be the very rancher's son, Bill Brazel, and that he found pieces after heavy rains that would wash up to the surface at the debris field. And he made, made the mistake one night when he was in a you know, local pub, Wade's Bar in Corona about an hour away from the ranch. And somebody asked, did you ever find anything? And he makes the comment, well, I found a few scraps. Well, who should be at his door the very next morning but a captain by the name of Emerson Armstrong, who we verified, and a number of non-commissioned officers. And they confiscated those scraps. And then they searched, you know, the rest of the house and they went out to the site and had him display where he had found those pieces. This was two years after the incident, Kevin. They were still watching. They were making sure that every piece of physical evidence remained in their possession. That's how important it was for them to ensure that the truth didn't get out. And to suggest that, oh, there's still pieces just floating around. Yes, uh, uh, Tom and I still, you know, you know, have that hope that uh, such evidence is still out there. But we've had so many false alarms and we've had so many, as far as disappointments in recent years, that they, they did a very good job. But uh, nonetheless, it, it's something that we, for as long as we're alive, we still want to hold that piece of that holy grail that we can you know, leave knowing that, yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it happened. And, and, you, won't, and you won't have to send that away to the lab where it'll get lost. You don't have to send it. You can, you can just hold it up and give a demonstration because we don't have, still don't have anything uh, like that. How life changing it would be to you know, you know, to to have some testimony from someone that would come forward, one of the children maybe of one of the family members. Um, I mean, obviously they're the ones that live on the, in this legacy right now. Is is the the Roswell children, which you've you know the children of Roswell, which you've uh, written about in one of your books as well. Um, I mean, I mean, most of them are still with us, aren't they? Most of the family members. Yes. Um... They are, and uh, we've had stories of so-and-so has a piece, and so-and-so has a piece, and so far they have denied it. Uh, why they are deny denying it, because we believe the, the people who told us. You know, we make a judgment on it, and, uh, but so far they've been denying that they have these pieces. Why they are denying it at this late date, I don't know. Maybe Don has a an opinion on that. I just don't understand because it would uh, verify our many decades of research. It, you know, you know how you, it's like an epiphany. We, you know, it's uh, that moment of victory that uh, our our search was not in vain. That we were right all along. And certainly, we would we 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 would like that. But uh, in lieu of that, we we still believe the case is what we said it was. But uh, we know they're out there. My hope is that someone, because there's a, between the uh, debris field site on the Brazel Ranch and the impact site, uh, 35 miles from there, there are the flight path of the remaining parts of the ship. And we believe that all along the way, pieces were falling off. And that maybe someday somebody will be out in the desert just looking around and a piece might have washed up or been blown up by the the winds out there and something something like that so two, two, two crash sites three three wow 
Okay, I didn't yes. know that. The Breefield site, a body site two and a half miles east of the Brazil Ranch site, and then another 30 miles for the impact site where the remaining part of the ship uh, came to rest. So, I mean, can you imagine if, if something like that happened now? With the technology that we've got, um, even, you know, even with just having a, you know, a, a smartphones with us, I mean, the, how would they contain something like that nowadays? Well, they wouldn't. Uh, yeah. And one has to, you know, actually be, or as we would say, go back to the scene of the crime. And as one, one of the things that strikes you immediately in the high desert of New Mexico, it's like another planet. I mean, that area has not changed in centuries. It's still all open range, used strictly for grazing of, of cattle and sheep. It's uh, much of it is owned as conservation property, Bureau of Land Management for, uh, for those sole purposes. And as a result, it sees very little traffic, very little human contact of any sort. And as a result, and Tom's absolutely correct, there could still be treasure out there. And it's just that it's going to take someone to serendipitously, you know, stumble upon it. But we do know that the military made an effort for years where they would go out and, and still search the site. Witnesses described that, uh, that for at least two to three years that they still would go out and, and canvas the area, making sure they had every last piece. And as to witnesses who still may be in possession, I think they received um, uh, enough threats early on that the military finally said to them, now, and if you ever find anything, it's your duty, it's your sworn duty to report it to us. And they know that they would just be opening up that old wound, which would uh, then, well, if you have one piece, we're sure you have more. And as a result, they feel the best thing to do is just deny, deny, deny. And as a result, who are Tom and I, who are the investigators to ever, you know, bring, uh, 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 you know, force them to relive something that was never pleasant because the, the very rancher, Matt Grazzo, I mean, the fact that they kept him for almost a full week and they threatened him with an insane asylum if he didn't, you know, cooperate. And I think uh, they just, they, they, they think they see the best thing to do is just mums the word, not admit anything. Absolutely, and and for even to take you know the debris of a weather balloon to um, Wright Patterson in Ohio, uh, it just seems a bit over the top. Just for you know, even though it was a, a sort of secretive project, the, the the whole balloon stuff was at the time. But I mean, it's just it's not the it wasn't the norm. And then you've got obviously the. Um, uh, the changing guard of the actual system itself taking place then with the, you know, the, the formation of the CIA and, and, and many other branches coming into play as well then. Uh, it just seems very, um, you know, it, that it's very connected, you know what I mean? That there's a reason that this all took place. And what did they actually capture? What have they still got? And what differences has it made in the evolution, uh, you know, of us right now? You know what I mean? With, with technology and everything else. I, I wonder how much... It, of that technology did make its way, you know, into uh, corporations and, and, and other company and other other departments. Well, we we always we always get the question of uh, what you just asked. Uh, what uh, you know, back engineering of the of the uh, crash, uh, the ship and the components of the ship, and uh, they say, oh, you know. Transistors. After right after World War II, there was a big explosion of technology, transistors and uh, lasers and uh, uh, things like Velcro yeah, has been mentioned. And uh, most of that, at least in my mind, was already under development or things were being developed during the World War II. That's one thing that happens in wars. Not that you like wars, is that new developments take place. Uh, you know, during during war, but the only the only uh, back engineering 
part that I uh, subscribe to is the memory metal. Very early on, like in early 1948, this was less than a year after the crash, Wright Patterson put out a contract to Battelle Memorial Institute in uh, Columbus, Ohio, to recapitulate, reconstruct this memory metal because it had such strange qualities that uh, you could bend it and bend it and you couldn't just dis distort it in any way. So we have information about that contract that it took place. We have the, the uh, progress reports and the final declaration in 1962 that they came up with, uh, they've invented this thing called Nitinol, N-I-T-I-N-O-L. And uh, Battelle, they didn't want to have any connection with the UFOs. So uh, they formed some of it out to the Naval Ordnance Lab in uh, Maryland. And they made the, the announcement of this Nitinol. And what it is, Kevin, it's our best attempt at trying to recapitulate, to try to back engineer the memory metal. You can look it up on your browser and on your computer, see what Nitinol is. Uh, it's got all the uh, qualities of uh, the memory metal, except you can cut it and uh, shape it any way you want. It's not as good as the original, but it's our best attempt at it. See, that's why when we are asked, where do you believe the material is today? And we always emphasize that even as the military originally had possession, took possession, and in essence, shut out all outside inquiry. They didn't have outside scientists to rely on to bring in to evaluate the material. So it had to be assimilated into the private sector. Point being, military doesn't manufacture anything. Planes, tanks, ships, everything is contracted out to the private sector. So that's why Tom and I remain convinced, you know, that's where the material, the wreckage is today. Private hands. The government doesn't have it, right. The government doesn't have it. The military doesn't have it. It's in private hands. But they're in yeah. hands that, that have government contracts that they want right. to keep. Right. Like uh, the Rand Corporation, uh, Battelle, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, the, what the, what the Bigelow, whatever he had. Bigelow, they want to, right. They want to keep the contracts, so they keep, they keep the secret. And of course, you can't do the FOIA request then, um, because there's nothing to yes. FOIA back on. Right. You know what I mean? Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That that's very clever how they keep that compartmentalized. And do you think it's so compartmentalized even nowadays that only very few know about this? Well, no matter how very many few know about it, they don't want to rock the boat because if you're in the military or you're in well, working for Rand, you want to get to your next promotion. And uh, you're not going to get there by rocking the ship. So if it's been kept secret, it's they're not going to ask about. Uh, oh, let, let's bring that thing forward, sir. We want we want the public to know. That's not going to get you your next uh, uh, new office. It was a concern, corner window. A concern we've we've always had because we were always hearing it from officers within the military, and that as much as they are des they desire that. The truth, the reality of the UFO phenomena is finally disclosed. This growing legion of, of new recruits, new officers. What we've observed is that the old order has not passed it down to the new. Therein would be part of that compartmentalization. The idea that, and sadly, most of the officers at Roswell, they took it with them. They took the knowledge of what transpired with them. They did not even share it with their own families. And to us, it's been one of the most frustrating elements in the entire investigation, that these were the most reluctant. These were the ones that had their pensions, their promotions at stake. These were the ones who were threatened as far as with $10,000, you know, fines and in 10 years imprisonment if they should ever talk well, about well, they, had, they had signed the Secrecy Act, obviously, as well. Non-disclosure as far as, uh, as far as, uh, when they would leave the service, for example. So, and as Tom was describing, and within the private sector, they want that, like Bigelow Aerospace, 
You know, they want that next government contract. They want that next grant. They want all that private funding as far as what keeps them in business. So they play, you know, you know, and, and they work in tandem. And then part of that is also keeping their mouth shut. You know, it's so weird to see the um, the, the space force, you know, taking um, taking its first leaps in, in, into you know into being formed right now. And you you see, there's a there's a new trailer that they've put out. You know, join the space force and all this. It's just so futuristic to kind of see it. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, well. Okay, I can I get it. You know, you want to militarize space. You, do you know what I mean? It's the best place to launch any counterattack from and stuff. But I wonder what else they they, they may be doing that for as well. Uh, it it does make you think. I mean, I think most of the 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 the, the, the sort of subjects on the secret space program that, that are out there are just nonsense. Um, but but you know, to to have some sort of military um, assets in space. I wonder what they really know. I wonder what they know. And, I, I, I'm, you know, with the Tic Tac kind of videos coming out as well, obviously, you know, w w who knows what, what, what else was not released on those videos? Well, Kevin, uh, I, I'm a historian. I, I, I'm looking backwards. And, uh, of course, I'm, you know, cognizant of uh, the space program, but I don't, I don't, that, that maybe I'm maybe I'm naive, but I, that doesn't interest me as much as history. Right now, history is uh, is my main focus because to me it explains the present and uh, whether they have a space force or a, you know something uh, equivalent to that. I say, oh, that's nice, but I don't I don't dwell on it because uh, my my mind thinks a different way than that. So. And personally, I think they, they, they foresee that the next war, the next world war, will most likely be fought in space, but not by uh, invaders from another planet, but between ourselves. That uh, and we know, and as far as uh, I was at the, uh, the NSA facility in Northern England, where I was pictured as far as in front of all those geodesic domes that... Um, are, are used as far as and the, the, the particle beam and uh, the laser beam uh, technology and the triangulation between here in the States and in England and even Australia. And that all is for bouncing that technology off of a, a satellite arrays. So I, I, I think that that's all in anticipation and uh, being able to set up a defense system as far as knocking missiles down, as far as the whole uh, Patriot missile uh, system, uh, as far as anti-missile uh, systems, and then as far as an EMP, electromagnetic pulse technology that could wipe out the uh, the electric grid in any one country, and and, and so it, it's a scary time, way beyond even the the, the current uh, uh, as far as a COVID nineteen virus situation, in that technology is taking us to the next level, and. Um, I think uh, in many respects, UFOs is a safe bet right now because it's still something that is far from threatening. And, and rather in de demonstrating their uh, mortality, that they are, uh, are very human in the respect that uh, whatever crashed met its fate and they died in that New Mexican desert back in 1947. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, what does it change to know that, that that Roswell happened? I guess it's the idea that, you know, we are not alone and the potential of mankind to, you know, for exploration out well, there. That... Statistically, everybody believes that there's other life, other intelligent life in the universe. Everybody believes that. Where the big divide comes is when uh, you, well, have you... You know, the question is asked, well, do you believe that any of that has ever visited Earth? That's where the big divide is, because all of your uh, professional people, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, prof you know, professors and, oh, no, no, I don't I don't believe that. Uh, but uh, that's where the big divide is. Of course, Don and I believe that we certainly were visited in 1947. And the modern age of UFOs, uh, that's when the modern age of UFOs started, was in uh, June of 1947. It's still with us. And uh, then the question is, well, why, why did they come here in 1947? We can only speculate. We don't really know. 
Was it the expl explosion of the atomic bomb? Who knows? But um, th that's 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 when it all started, and it's with us. And as Don said, the things going on in space, certainly space will, will provide certainly a theater of operation in any future war. But uh, my, my bigger interest is in history, because to me, history has explained so much of the present. And uh, so that's, that's where my focus is. Well, well, where would you like to, I mean, what is, I mean, obviously your end goal for this is just to keep going on and, you know, con continue in this research. Um, but I mean, obviously you've got a, a book coming out uh, towards the end of this year, which is kind of, I think it was termed, was it uh, the Roswell case closed? Um, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's not closed though, is it? What, what is the new book that's coming out this year? Well, it is, it well, is called well, Case Closed. You're still researching it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's called The Ultimate Cold Case with a big... Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember the old Jack Webb uh, uh, dragnet where at the end of the show they would have a guy go boom, boom, and it it put the seal of the, the uh, dragnet... Uh, Mark 7. Right. Yes. Uh, but uh, I think it's our acknowledgement that the case, as far as the investigation is, is winding down because everybody's dead. Everybody's dead. Uh, we're talking to uh, children, and, and some of the children are dying off now. We're talking increasingly to grandchildren. So the, the heyday of the big investigation, which started uh, with uh, Randall and Schmidt in 1988, uh, 89, I believe, I think Don will agree, that's those were the heydays because everybody, most everybody was still alive. Unfortunately, we didn't have the internet back then. If we had the internet, boy, we would know so much more in finding people. So, uh, yeah, we literally had to track them down back at that time. And it was, uh, and I certainly, I remember Kevin and I, our monthly uh, phone bills between the two of us uh, were about a thousand dollars each month and you had yeah. to know you had to know where the person lived to to call uh, right. information you had to know where the person lived now you just plug a name into the internet uh, in this what they call it switchboard mm -hmm. and uh up comes a list of the people with that name yeah so no i can't imagine so, but, i mean I think it could be a, a fascinating documentary, just your journey, do you know what I mean, of what, of what you've... Well, and, and the, the means by which we were tracking these people down, I mean, we were going through air certification, for example, assuming that because so many of them were former Air Force, former you know, Army Air Corps, that they had been pilots, that they would have, uh, you know, stayed licensed as even private pilots. So uh, we would check, you know, as far as uh, th through those... Uh, outlets and we would check through motor vehicle, you know, assuming that they were licensed drivers. We would say we were compiling uh, reunion lists and we were asking as far as uh, known uh, witnesses, can you help us track down so-and-so who was in your squadron? And then they would assist us. And we were working through the Veterans Administration and we actually worked with hackers who <laughs> were going through the VA with, uh, you know, uh, it's for to us. It was more important to find these people, and um, we knew we were always racing with the Undertaker. And uh, the we, Undertaker has arrived. The Undertaker has arrived, and as a result, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we literally tracked down hundreds of these people, and uh, more times than not, they wouldn't talk. It was all denial especially officers involved, but for the ones that they finally opened up, the testimonies, the confessions were consistent. The patterns were there. They described the wreckage identically from witness to witness. And then those who described the bodies, whether, whether military or civilian, down to even the color of the uniforms they were wearing, they were describing the exact same thing. And to me, that was the most uh, you know, amazing thing of the entire investigation, Kevin, that whether it was the military or whether it was the civilian, they were reading from the same script. In other words, their accounts were identical 
And the only way they could be falsifying such information is that they were reading from the same script or they had actually been there. They experienced the same thing. And Tom and I, we certainly believe it was the latter. They were actually involved. They repeat, they describe what they saw and what they saw was not from this planet. And who was the most important witness? Um, there, there is not one most important. Uh, the, the one, first one that comes to mind is uh, Major Edwin Easley, who was the provost marshal from of the base uh, of the Roswell base back in '47, and when uh, Randall and Schmidt were, you know, trying to decide is there really something to this, uh, they interviewed uh, Easley, and all he would say was, "I can't answer that. I'm sworn to secrecy. I'm more, I'm sworn to secrecy." Well, finally, I think it was Kevin asked him, "Well." Can you tell us if we're on the on the going in the right direction? And easily says, "Well, what direction are you talking about?" And uh, I think it was Kevin said, uh, "Well, that it was a crashed UFO, crashed flying saucer." And Easy said, uh, "Well, let me tell you this: you're not going in the wrong direction." And I think that was at the time a big uh, witness. A standard military response: I didn't admit anything, but I still told you everything. And certainly Walter Hott, the public information officer, and his posthumous uh, a statement acknowledging uh, not only the wreckage, but the remains of the, the craft, the pod, the capsule, and then his two seeing the bodies. And so any of the officers and the crewmen who were on a, some of the special flights who described more than just the wreckage, who described remains, who described bodies, clearly suggesting that this was beyond, you know, as the old saying, uh, weather balloons don't have pilots. So we were, we were clearly dealing with something that uh, was beyond the pale and something that, to, to their credit, they didn't, uh, you know, you know, there wasn't any mass suicide. They weren't, you know, as far as panicking in the streets, they continued their service to the country. They raised their families. They lived out their lives, and they were there back in '47. So, should we be expected to, uh, you know, you know, do any less? And we weren't there, but they were. Well, listen, um, <laughs> your latest book's coming out, and we've been putting it up on the screen as well. And uh, that's a sort of pictorial guide to uh, the Roswell and a lot of your work over the many years. So uh, that, I believe, is available now. Uh, the link is in the description below. And is there a website for you guys as well? Yes, it's www.roswellinvestigator.com. All one word, www.roswellinvestigator.com. I believe the books are up. Uh, on, up they yeah. got them up now, and they can order them there i would i would think yes. okay yes no we could talk for hours and hours i mean there's so much to this case and um you know yeah so listen guys i just want to say first of all thank you both so very much for coming back on uh really appreciate that and uh you know hats off to you for all the years worth of work that you've done towards this case it's amazing thank you thank, thank you kevin, kevin. You've thank you it's been there for us you've always been a a big supporter and uh, it won't be eight more years let's 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 do something again soon i think so i think so most definitely well thank you thank you kevin